you, uh, Peter, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever folks are joining us from. We really appreciate you joining us today for this uh, really exciting webinar that's going to be focused on uh, information and communication technology for monitoring and evaluation programming for refugee populations. Um, my name is Anthony Bloom, and I'm a USAD in the Office of Education. I support uh, education technology. I'm also um, proud to be a member supporting the two networks that are uh, helping organize uh, today's uh, webinar. And these include USAID's Education and Crisis and Conflict Network, or ECCN. And I imagine a number of colleagues on the phone may be part of that network. And then a technology task team as part of the uh, uh, International Network of Education and Emergencies uh, that's co-hosting uh, today's uh, session, and I'm affiliated with uh, both groups. Um, what we're really excited by is the exploration that this and future webinars will have looking at how technology can add value to education in a crisis and conflict settings. Um, and obviously this topic is relevant because of the the growing scale of which we're all aware of the global refugee crisis, and obviously the challenges that that, um, that we have in regards to uh, effectively, sustainably, scalably supporting programming to support uh, learners in these uh, in these settings, and, and really looking specifically at what the role of technology broadly defined can be in helping us uh, serve these education needs. Um, so today we'll be focusing on understanding how we could leverage technology to appropriately monitor and evaluate education programs for refugees. And I think there's both the use of technology to monitor and evaluate programs, but also importantly that we simply have more investments in regards to monitoring and evaluation more broadly in the field of technology and education, that we can really identify those good practices that can be replicated and scaled. Uh, this webinar is part of a series that um, these two networks are organizing around technology in emergency settings. And, um, and we're really excited that we have some other ones that are planned and in the works, including one on game-based learning that will be featured in late October, and then one on ICT and higher education that will be hosted in November. Um, there's a variety of opportunities for you to engage uh, in these um, webinars. The ECCN itself regularly hosts webinars in various topics. Um, and to become a member of um, that, to be informed about those events, it's eccnnetwork.net, but we'll send that around, we'll circulate that around if, should you want to join. I should also say that some of you may be joining us next week for an annual event that my office helps organize with partners called the Mobiles for Education Alliance Symposium. That will be taking place in Washington, D.C. on October 5th and 6th. For those of you who are on the phone that um, might be available or interested in joining us, please shoot me an email. We can make my email available as well. We have a few uh, invitation-only slots still available. And crisis and conflict will be one of the focal areas, uh, as it's been for the last six uh, annual symposium as well. So without further ado, I really appreciate the opportunity and look forward to the discussion from our colleagues who will be uh, talking about um, some really interesting projects working in this space. I do want to turn it over at this point to Lisa Hartenberger, uh, who works with our ECCN network, to take it away and provide the introductions for the, the next steps for this webinar. Thank you for the invitation and look forward to the discussion. Lisa? Thanks very much, Tony. Um, as Tony said, my name is Lisa hartenberger Toby. Um, I provide support to ECCN and uses of uh, ICT, and I also manage Education Development Center's monitoring and evaluation team. So I'm particularly interested um, in the topic today as well. Um, I'll be introducing our two presenters to you, and I'll be managing our question and answer session at the end. But before we get started, just a few housekeeping tips um, for those of you who may not participate in that many webinars. Please do mute your microphone, uh, which helps uh, minimize background noise. Um, if you are having bandwidth issues, you can turn off uh, the video. Um, and if you need to adjust your audio uh, settings, just go under uh, the audio menu. Um, if you are having any connection issues while you're connecting, please just type it into the chat area um, or email uh, the, the address up there, webinars at ineesite.org, um, and we have technical support that can assist you. Um, 
We won't be taking questions until the very end, until both presentations are already finished, uh, but you can post questions in the chat area at any time uh, during the presentations. We'll be collecting all of those questions um, and then we'll be addressing them at the end of the presentations. Um, if you also want to just raise your hand, use the little hand button um, at the end, we can also take questions that way. Um, this session is being recorded, so uh, if you want to look back, uh, you're welcome to look at the recording and the presentations will be available on the INE website as well as the ECCN um, websites. Uh, so you can also forward um, any information to colleagues who might be interested. Um, so I'll get started with our, our presenting our, our two, um, uh, two presenters today. We're going to be starting with Alison Krupar. Um, Allie is a researcher at Pennsylvania State University. Uh, she currently serves as the Senior Associate uh, Managing the Right to Education Index, which is an international index monitoring the satisfaction of the right to education. Um, she also teaches monitoring and evaluation at Penn State and American University, as well as introductory adult education courses online. Um, her work focuses on education for those affected by violent conflict um, and migration and displacement, and she specifically engages in monitoring and evaluation of educational programming and planning. She holds a PhD in lifelong learning and adult education um, and comparative and international education from Pennsylvania State. So, thank, uh, so welcome to Ali. Um, our second presenter is Alban Croqueta. Uh, she is education manager of the Instant School Network Schools program at the Vodafone Foundation. Uh, where she has worked on the Connecting for Good strategy, which supports education in refugee camps using technology in collaboration with UNHCR. Um, she has worked as a strategy and innovation consultant for the telecom and digital industry, as well as working with the NGO uh, Telecom Sans Frontières as a volunteer responder. Uh, she's responded to disasters in the Philippines um, and Indonesia and regularly deploys to refugee camps, mostly in Africa. So Aban holds um, a Master's of Science in ICT from the Asian Institute of Technology um, and graduated as a telecom engineer from Telecom Sud Paris. Uh, so welcome to both of you and I'll pass it straight over um, to Ali. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Is this? Yeah. So as the introduction, um, my name is Ali Krupar, and I have been working um, on a variety of projects. Uh, the one I'm presenting uh, today is based off of work with REST International, uh, partially supported by the Faster Forward Fund. And this is an ICT for m and &E project where we were using uh, local resources in order to improve uh, youth participation in monitoring and evaluation of youth-led projects through a non-formal education project. So this project compared youth who use auto photography to identify impacts and outcomes from projects that they initiated in their community um, with youth who did more traditional monitoring and evaluation, um, documenting through observational checklists and um, uh, informational interviews. So, we're looking at, instead of the outcome of the evaluation, the outcome of comparing the two methods, one using photography um, as an ICT for m and &E solution, and one that's using without that ICT component. Um, and so hopefully this will be useful for practitioners who are working in hard to reach locations where conducting evaluation on the ground is a little bit difficult. Um, I'm being told I'm a little bit too quiet. That's a new thing for me. So I'm gonna try to speak a little bit louder. So uh, the other thing to keep in mind about this project is we're working in the Dadaab refugee camp. So this is where the, you know, there's some insecurity issues in accessing projects that are happening in the camp, in monitoring what's going on in, in those locations. Um, and we really are trying to engage the youth themselves who are working in the project to lead uh, on the monitoring and evaluation. So it was part educational in their, their role as monitoring and evaluation as evaluators, um, and partly as the organizational side, trying to find out what was happening in the communities based off of these projects. So, okay, I'm gonna do this. Um, very quickly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the problem, which I've already alluded to, and then what the solution we came up with using local resources, knowledge, and a participatory action research project. 
Um, and then talk a little bit about the results of comparing these two methods of using photography and not using photography. Uh, so the problem is that we had, uh, first of all, the, the project itself is youth-led social change projects in uh, RET International's Youth Capacity Building for Social Change program. And so these varied across uh, topics that youth identified themselves after participating in RET-sponsored and supported training. Um, so the main emphasis of the project is that youth would lead these social change projects in their communities and then be able to identify what works, what doesn't work. And so that was part of this participatory action research project. Um, the other problem, which I've already alluded to, is the insecurity in the camps restricted m and &E officers at RET to be able to go in and find out what was really happening after these projects took place, um, or during the projects in some cases. And so the physical monitoring was difficult, uh, and working with youth in order to engage um, in monitoring was the solution that we came up with. Um, and then the capacity itself, one part of the project itself is to build youth capacity in order to undertake these projects. And so monitoring and evaluation is an important component of that. So our solution um, was to use what I'm calling auto photography, but really what it is, is that we would provide cameras to the youth who are participating in these projects and leading these projects um, that they designed and ask them to document uh, what they perceived as the outcomes or potential impacts of the projects in which they led. That process came about by using smartphones, uh, digital photography, the youth we were working with, many of whom had already used smartphones and cameras in order to take their own pictures. Um, and we're very eager to learn more about how to use it. So there was a training on how to use the cameras and how to do the monitoring and evaluation um, for people who were participating with or without the cameras. Um, and so the other component is that we wanted the youth to be engaging in monitoring and evaluation rather than the organizational staff entirely doing the sort of oversight capacity. And that was part of a participatory action research project. The youth were engaged not just as, as beneficiaries, but as um, evaluators themselves. And then, of course, we have this comparative approach of looking at these two different types. And that came about because we wanted to see if the photography, um, where the youth were actually engaging in the, the monitoring and evaluation by documenting it using basic ICT resources, what would be more useful um, would, would reveal different data than using more traditional approaches. Um, and so auto photography, just as a brief background, comes out of photo voice projects, um, a lot of different monitoring and evaluation research that uses photography in order to influence policy, change programming. Um, there's a long history of this. And again, we're looking at a, a more, a, Less high tech, but still using tech in monitoring and evaluation approach here. The other thing to keep in mind is this is a, a, a most significant change evaluation. When we talk about impacts, we're not talking about RCTs. We're thinking about what are youth identifying as the significant changes in their community. So it's, it's very qualitative um, in the data that we've collected. The results first is to think about what the projects were. So the youth-led photographic evaluations were focusing on different issues that they identified in their community um, that they had done different activities on. So some of the activities would be sporting events or community meetings or community cleanups where everybody would get together um, or youth working with adults in order to um, repair construction on particular uh, facilities. There were these all were identified by the youth prior to any of the evaluation component. So they identified their projects, uh, they conducted the projects, and then we met after the projects to talk about how they would do evaluation and how they could use these tools for monitoring and evaluation in, in their communities. Um, 
So in both groups, we used uh, auto, auto photography and those who didn't. Um, there were some biases. There were some similar results. Um, there were things that came out about uh, social cohesion activities. I, there was a lot that was similar in the results from both groups. But there was the real uh, crux of the comparison between using the auto photography and not was thinking about the depth, the depth of the information that we received. So uh, because it's a photographic project, I wanted to share some photos. We have, this was an example that was given by one of the youth who was talking about child labor as an issue. Um, and they described how the youth are in the markets and unable to, to attend school. This one uh, was a particular photograph showing a, a child actually engaging in labor, carrying um, what I think was coal or um, fuel back and forth between community and uh, the market. And so that's just one example of some of the data that was, was gained from looking at the photographic element. Uh, when we compared the methods themselves, so with auto photography and without auto photography, you can see on this slide some of the themes that came up. The themes were very similar, right? The the projects that the youth were engaging in um, made were were the same regardless of whether or not they were using auto photography, uh, because they had already identified those projects. Uh, but with auto photography, the youth were more able to identify observable change, whereas without auto photography in interviews and discussion um, of what had changed in the community using the most significant change interviewing approach, observable change wasn't something that came up. Um, the other things that were different is that more projects were identified for future development um, with the youth who used auto photography compared to those who didn't. Um, and that may be also related to uh, something I've alluded to earlier, that the youth, the, the training involved for the youth who were using auto photography, they were um, trained in how to use the cameras more. Uh, it was slightly different. The rapport was slightly more with the youth who were using photography. And then there were also more identified challenges. So that's you know, a strength but also showing that the youth who are using auto photography may have been more engaged in the evaluation process um, because of their use of these tech tools. And so this is just another example of a, a photograph that the youth showed. This was actually showing impact in, in this particular example. They were talking about how they, uh, the youth were able to develop revision groups where they would review and revise uh, together before or after school. And so this is a photo documenting one of those groups meeting. And so some of the recommendations that came out of our um, you know, comparison between using these two tools is obviously engaging youth in the evaluation process was particularly beneficial. The more rapport we were able to build with youth, uh, whether it was uh, through the photography or through more face-to-face -face time, um, they, the more likely the youth would be able to provide challenges, would feel free to talk about what future projects that they were planning. So really engaging youth in the evaluation process, in this participatory process, uh, was valuable. Uh, using local resources. I, I saw a question came up. That's why I hesitated. But I'll, I'll get to that later um, in, when we get when we come back for Q&A. Uh, using local resources was, a very, was very important because it showed that youth were able to use the technology in their community um, for different purposes. So a lot of their, the DUB does not have you know, universal smartphone use by a long shot, but there are a lot of phones, and there are a lot of phones that have photographic capabilities. Uh, so using local resources like individuals' um, mobile phones is particularly useful. Using local knowledge of knowing how to take photographs um, through these tools is also useful. Uh, and then also, the last part was really enjoying the project evaluation, making it an enjoyable process and less of a chore. Um, that I think came out of the interviews with youth because they were, they were so engaged in the process. Um, 
and involved from the beginning of their project design to eventually telling us what worked and what didn't in their projects so that we could continue the youth capacity building um, training as well as future projects. Uh, and again, here's just some more photographs of what the youth came up with. This was a, a youth association meeting um, that they were that they documented to show that there had been more youth engagement as leaders in the community following um, activities that they had implemented. And then here's another uh, youth engagement activity. And this is a, a sensitization campaign um, where youth are, are together as well as other people in the community to talk about issues that that, that are pressing. Uh, the other component, which I haven't had much opportunity to talk about here um, in the project, but was very important in the project design, is encouraging youth adult partnerships. So not separating youth out as um, one group siloed within the community, but how youth are engaging with adults. Uh, and this picture was given as an example of youth and adults working together to solve a problem. Uh, they're repairing some structures here together. And so I didn't talk a lot about the how people were identified into which groups and some of the more technical um, methodological backgrounds. So if you have questions about that, feel free. Um, but I wanted to keep this really short so we could get into uh, the conversation. So thank you. My contact information is here if you want to talk individually. And then we can also, um, I look forward to your questions. Great, thanks so much, Ali. Uh, we'll just pass right straight over to Alban, um, and then we'll take questions after Alban's presentation from everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Um, hello, everyone. Can I just check if the sound is working? It looks like it. Yes, perfect. Um, it's so de delighted to be with you today. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, I'm working for the Deaf Foundation and more specifically for the Instant Network Schools program. Uh, and before we start discussing um, the, the topic uh, of today, which is the use of ICT um, towards uh, monitoring and evaluation of um, educational programming, um, I just want to really briefly introduce the INS program. Um, for those who are not familiar uh, with, um, with, with the program. Um, so the Instant Network Schools program um, started in 2014 as a joint collaboration between UNHCR and Sudafan Foundation. Uh, and the concept of the program is really um, to provide students and teachers in refugee camps with access to um, technology, uh, internet, digital educational tools um, to really enhance the quality of learning in the refugee context. So as such, the INS program is really building on the existing school infrastructure in the refugee camps. So we work with UNHCR and the educational partners um, to integrate and complement uh, existing education programming. So within this project, technology is really not seen as an end goal. Uh, it's seen as an enabler. So the program is not about um, teaching about computer science or ICT. It's really about leveraging technology um, to improve the delivery of classes, uh, to improve the way teachers are preparing for their lessons for any topics included into the local curriculum. Uh, and the INS, um, so the Instant Network Schools program, we, we call it INS, um, is really based on a holistic approach. Um, and we have defined nine key pillars that are essential uh, for the program to be successful in the grant. And some of those pillars, as you can see in the slide, are very much uh, focused on the technology, um, such as uh, the provision of hardware, connectivity, power, etc. But this needs to be complemented by 
other elements, um, such as educational content, uh, a strong teacher training program, uh, making sure there is a human-centered design approach uh, being implemented to make sure there is local ownership of the program uh, and the teams on the ground are able to lead uh, locally-led initiatives. Uh, and as you can see on, in the slides, um, the monitoring and evaluation Peace is very centric um, to um, and critical uh, to the success of the ANS program. So at the moment, um, just um, a clear, um, a short overview. So we have uh, 31 schools uh, across four countries, which are um, Kenya, Tanzania, DRC, and South Sudan. And every month we reach out um, to about 40,000 students um, and 600 teachers across those schools. So now coming back to, to the topic of the day, I'm just to share with you uh, a bit of history um, around our approach to m and &E for the INS program. So initially when we started, we actually designed um, an m and &E framework um, which meant, was meant to, to capture the level of activities in the INS Center but also to measure impact. And this m and &E framework was um, heavily relying on manual data collection uh, process and a lot of uh, paper-based reporting mechanism. A few months after operation and testing of this m and &E framework um, really outlined uh, some of the some major challenges with this approach um, and those challenges were mainly linked to the operational context and constraints in the field and that Ali touched on for example in, in Dadaab Refugee Camps and, and those contexts are, um, can be found also in, in other camps. Um, so what we found is that actually data using this manual um, M&E framework came in um, very late uh, and there were huge delays between the time the data is effectively collected in the fields and the time we actually received it. And from time to time the data could be either incomplete or inconsistent uh, across the four countries we are effectively operating in. So as a technology company, um, and given that the, the project was all about uh, bringing ICT tools and connectivity to the schools, uh, it came naturally to us um, that we should move actually from this paper-based uh, M&E uh, approach to uh, something that is more led by the technology and really leveraging the tools available to us uh, and by this data collection platform specifically um, to be able to improve uh, on uh, M&E of the INS program. So uh, when we implemented this um, so mobile based M&E uh, platform, which I'm going to detail uh, in a little faster, um, we noticed some great improvements in terms of the quality of data we received from the field. Um, and what do I mean really by, by quality? Um, well, there are really four criteria um, that we're using. The first one is that the data came in in a timely manner. So whereas before, as I mentioned, there were often a lot of delays between um, the collection um, to the analysis of the data, uh, we are now able with the solution we implemented to virtually access the data immediately. Um, so, so it's almost live data coming from all the activities we have across the four countries. Secondly, uh, the data is effectively more consistent because as we deployed um, and designed uh, this m and &E solution, we really worked with all the teams in the field uh, to make sure that the tools would be useful, uh, would fit the local conditions and limitation, and through the process we also very much aligned on all the terminology and definitions to ensure um, some consistency across the four countries and across all the teams when they are reporting data. Thirdly, um, the data is, is becoming more reliable um, and that's really because we, we moved from um, a paper-based um, data collection process 
which um, where there is room for human mistakes. So, you know, if um, the team is effectively completing survey on paper and then passing on to uh, the project manager who is capturing all the information on Excel spreadsheets, this is, uh, there is room for, for human mistakes. Uh, and through the technology, we effectively reduce uh, the space and enable, enable us to have more reliable data. And through the technology as well, uh, we have seen that um, the system is leading to more data ownership from the local team as well. Um, so they can see the data, they can visualize it through the uh, m e dashboards that we have. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's driving more ownership uh, and ensuring the integrity of the data. So it's, it's all well and good to have and to collect a lot of data, um, but I think coming back really at, at the purpose of this uh, data and why we're putting so much effort uh, into um, having an, uh, as much as efficient as possible an M&E um, platform is, is really um, because it's impacting um, the program, both at a strategic level, um, because through the data we collect, we're effectively able to demonstrate impacts, validate uh, some of the strategic objectives that were defined with UNHCR, and uh, also better engage with all the stakeholders uh, or funders uh, that are involved in the project to effectively drive more buy-in. Um, but also, and really importantly, um, data has an impact on our operation and the way we operate and deliver the program. Because we have more data, we have a more agile approach and we take some data-driven decision um, to be able to iterate all the time on solutions that we implement in the grants. Um, so data is, is really important at those two uh, levels, the strategic and operational. So concretely, how does the solution work? Um, well, it's a three-step approach. So the first approach is relying on a mobile application that um, we have uh, available through dedicated tablets um, that the local team is effectively using. So the INS coaches, which are um, here every day in the schools and effectively managing the instant classroom, helping the teachers to uh, deliver the lesson, etc. So those focal points, um, key focal points uh, that are local, are responsible for submitting the data to us. So they are using this mobile application, and in this application, there are some predefined surveys um, that we all worked out together and that they can complete and that would um, provide us information on any type of activities that is happening in the INS centers. Uh, once uh, the coaches submitted their surveys, it would be uh, available for validation to the project manager. So the project manager is effectively sitting at the camp level and is overlooking um, all the INS schools in, in this given camp. So the project manager is then able to engage and discuss with the coaches to validate or ask for the data to be modified, etc. Uh, the third step, so once the information has been validated by the project manager, it would automatically um, be published and be pushed onto what we call the live data dashboard. And this dashboard is available online to any uh, stakeholders of the program, um, either the local team or management team, and to be able to uh, view, uh, visualize, uh, and analyze the data um, that is being submitted. So just to give you a, a better idea, and, and I hope the screenshots are, are clear for everyone, but this is um, some pictures of, of the dashboard and what it looks like um, to give you an idea of the kind of information we, we collected, we, we are collecting. Um, so for example, we have graphically available the number of monthly beneficiaries for, for all the centers. Um, we also collect um, the gender information uh, in terms of the beneficiaries, um, the level of school activities, so we're able to identify how many lessons um, happen in a given uh, instant classroom uh, on a per school grade basis, 
um, have information about uh, what the classes were all about in terms of uh, topics, the type of educational content that was used, etc. So all those information are extremely uh, valuable for us to, to be able to plan uh, the operation of, of the INS program. In addition to all those data collected, we also use uh, MNE dashboards to have a kind of ticketing platform. So the uh, local team are effectively able, still using this mobile app, able to report any issues that they may have in, in their center. Could be technical issue, could be a request for support, et cetera. And we are using this platform to centralize any request and, and therefore better manage um, when it's to be done uh, and what should be our priorities, et cetera, and a way to communicate updates to the team. Uh, and linking back to Ali's presentation, we also try to integrate within this platform a, a blog functionality, which really enable us to capture more of the qualitative feedback coming from the program. So all the teams are able to have a voice uh, effectively on, on this blog and share any stories or any new initiatives that they piloted within the INS schools. And this tool really enables us to, uh, well, share both practice, uh, connect all the teams together because we're working across four countries. Um, so this link is actually important and just a mechanism to inspire the teams to do, to do more and, and to try more initiatives. Um, great, I'm coming back. So just to, just to, to wrap up, um, I think that there are a couple of lessons that I, I wanted to highlight um, for you today in terms of our lessons learned from, from this experience of uh, rolling out um, the, the m and &E platform and the m and &E solution. Um, I think firstly, it's really important to, to try to really adapt to the operational context and the limitations. And so you need to have a solution that would work in the worst scenario possible. Um, to give you an example, in, in a school, in theory, we have um, internet access. But we acknowledge um, that internet, um, we could have a breakdown of internet uh, at some point. Um, so the solution we design and the mobile app we're using is effectively working in um, offline context as well as online. Um, so having solutions and, and plan for backups uh, is, is always um, important. Uh, secondly, I mentioned I think it's really important to involve um, the field team through the design process uh, to make sure you build ownership. And once you start rolling out the, the solution, they will effectively be using it and see the value of it. And um, thirdly, um, ensure all the technical infrastructure is in place. Um, so that's important so that you don't get any barriers uh, for people to actually use your solution. And so in our case, for example, that included the distribution of dedicated many tablets for the team to be able to do the reporting um, without having any constraints or, or relying on their own phone, et cetera, or own devices. Um, the data validation cycle um, that we have in place, so having the project manager reviewing the entry from uh, the INS coaches is, is an important key success factor um, because they enable the team to be fully aware of what's happening um, within, uh, within the camp. Um, but also it enables some, some data validation and making sure the data going through the platform is, is actually verified. And, and finally, once all those data are collected, um, I think it's really important to involve the local teams in the analysis um, and actually provide some contextual information about the data and uh, to be able to inform strategic, strategic decisions about the program. Um, and actually, because we have this many dashboards and users are, are able to go and, uh, and check the results for their own schools themselves. Um, there is, um, we're starting to see the INS coaches to actually provide us themselves with the context, uh, contextual information to, for us to have the key to analyze the data they submitted. 
And finally, I think um, you need to be agile and iterative, uh, both in terms of your program delivery, but also the m and &E platform. So the, the version that you see on the screenshot is actually the third version. So we started with simpler um, data reporting and data points, um, and over time we're actually increasing the scope of it um, to get more and more information from the team. Uh, and we are actually looking at the moment to integrate more of the qualitative and impact data through this platform. So that would include uh, measuring ICT literacy skills improvement, um, looking at the school attendance systems, etc. So bit by bit, we as as people are getting used to this new system, we are building more and more capability uh, onto onto our dashboard. Okay, I'm going to stop here because I, I think I'm running out of time, uh, but looking forward to the Q&A discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much to both of our presenters. Oh, am I on? Um, so we'll be starting. Can you hear me? Um, we'll be starting with the question and answer period now. Um, I thought what we could do is take uh, maybe three questions for each of our presenters, um, and, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions to either presenter. Uh, we've got about a little over 15 minutes left for questions, so I think that's a, a good amount of time. Um, so we've got um, a couple of questions uh, for Alban that we'll start with. Um, a couple, two questions on whether the uh, dashboard and the blogs are internal or publicly accessible. Um, and then another question for Alban on uh, whether do you feel having a live dashboard that many staff um, uh, across the project and stakeholders can view help to incentivize that timely data collection and to talk more about that. And the last question that we'll take for Alban for now is when she says involve the local team to contextualize the data, what does she mean about contextualization? So I'll throw that over to you, Alban, for those three questions. Sure. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I'm going to first, uh, first take the, the question about um, the accessibility of the m and &E dashboards. Um, so at the moment, because we um, actually started the process last January and we are in the process of getting all the teams uh, on board and um, effectively uh, measure the impact of, of this dashboard, it's, it's currently all internal. So the page is actually password protected. Um, but the plan is um, probably in, in the next coming months and to open it up to the general public to some extent. Um, so not all the data will be av available. And some of the blogs, for example, um, includes um, some, some data um, that we may not be able to share for privacy um, and child protection reasons. Um, but the plan is um, in the coming months to, to have it uh, to have a public version of, of this dashboard. Um, but if there is an interest um, uh, in uh, in the audience to to have uh, a more detailed um, view of the of the dashboard and and have a session to to run through it, I'm I'm really open to that. So I'm sure we'll share the contact details and and feel free to to contact me um, separately. Um, in terms of so, so driving um, so this, this dashboard being um, an incentive for, for the local team to effectively report um, data, I, I think the technology uh, really provided a lot of different incentives to the local team um, to, to report data. Um, the fact that everyone is able to see it uh, online and, and all the project stakeholders are able to comment is, is probably definitely an incentive. Um, but I think just the keenness of sharing what they are doing in their centers and, and, and showing to everyone that there is a lot of activities happening is an incentive in itself. Um, but what we found as well is that the, the coaches are actually um, quite pleased with the tool because they view it um, as something that is more less time consuming as before. 
because before they really had to capture everything on paper uh, and then reconcile all the data uh, on a monthly basis. And, and it was actually really time consuming for them. So the fact that they can use this mobile app with pre-designed survey and it literally takes two minutes at the end of each activity to complete, and they actually view it as a, as a real benefit to them. Um, in, in opposition to uh, the paper-based processes, if that makes sense. Um, and finally, um, so in terms of contextualization, what I mean is that, um, so it, it's really interesting because, um, so we really implemented this solution last January, and so we're starting to have um, the trends over a nine months period. And so we're starting to see um, the level of activities going up and down depending on the months. Um, and actually having some context um, to actually explain why the level of activities is going down or up in a given month is really important. Um, and only the local team is able to provide uh, this information. It could be um, the activities is going down because there was actually the exam period, so the classroom wasn't used as much because everyone was busy and taking exams. Uh, it could be that uh, internet went down for uh, a couple of weeks, which did happen uh, in, in Tanzania, and we immediately saw the impact uh, in terms of um, teachers coming in to prepare the lesson. Um, that um, was a, an immediate drop almost uh, when the internet went down. So all of those information that actually can um, help you explain um, the data uh, is really important and only the local team can provide you with this information if you don't have, if you're not on site all the time, which is our case. Thanks very much, Elvan. So uh, we do have a couple more questions for her, but I want to make sure we get in time for everyone. So uh, we'll turn now to some questions for Ali. Uh, we have three questions for Ali. The first one, how did you choose those who will take part in the auto photography evaluation? What were the selection criteria? Uh, the second is, how did you deal with privacy issues related to the photos? Um, and the third, again, I think of security, has there been an issue or concern on youth security in the camp as a result of having access to the smartphones? Um, so I'll give the mic to you, Ali. So in terms of how we chose who would take part in an auto photography evaluation, we, the structure of the job is, for those who aren't familiar, is that there are five camps, and there were projects occurring in each of the camps. And so within the youth who had already been participating in the project in terms of designing um, their own youth-led uh, social change activities, those who were participating, we basically randomly selected by camp. So if we had four participants who were participating or who were leading social change activities and would be involved in the monitoring and evaluation from Cambios, two of them were randomly assigned to the auto photography um, group and two were assigned to the more traditional monitoring and evaluation group. Uh, and that was just to minimize any bias that we could, but we also had the, to have that geographic location. And again, this being the most significant change project and really just testing out the auto photography, we're not using a very large um, sample. We had uh, 20 participants in each group, um, or 18. So we're not drawing on, uh, you know, we're not trying to be representative of all youth or even all youth who are engaged in these projects, but rather the youth who had been involved from the very beginning in the projects and were volunteering to participate in the monitoring and evaluation. Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, in terms of the privacy issues, now this obviously comes up a lot with photography. And in monitoring and evaluation, whether you're working with uh, you know, staff who don't have backgrounds in monitoring and evaluation, um, there's a lot of training that happens. So in our case, working with beneficiaries, um, the, we conducting a, conducted a training, uh, and part of that training, especially for, for the participants in the auto photography group, was uh, asking permission and talking about how you approach people 
and whether or not they, how, how they'll respond and what you do in those situations. And in the interviews after the data collection, um, some youth did talk about like this, these people were upset with me for taking this photograph. Uh, obviously those photographs weren't shared here. Uh, and in the sharing here, I tried to minimize so that there were, you know, we didn't have any direct shots of people's faces. Um, but dealing with privacy issues is difficult when we have the youth who are going out and taking the photographs because I can, I can get the information back on my end that they, you know, ask permission and talk to the people about whether or not they could share their photographs. But uh, I can't guarantee, you know, that that was actually what happened in the field. Uh, given the training, we hope for the best that the, those um, those conversations happened when the photography happened. Uh, but again, for me to share any of the photographs from there, it's really identifying photographs that aren't showing full face, that are, you know, as, as trying to be, um, trying to, to minimize putting anybody in uh, an uncomfortable position. Um, and you did talk about the, the challenges of some people not wanting to be photographed and making sure that they had permission and, and that everything was okay, um, either after the fact, deleting the photograph or uh, talking to them ahead of time. In terms of youth security in the camp, this actually came up a lot uh, in the interviews because we were, were really thinking about what the youth social change projects were contributing to uh, peace building, social cohesion, reduction of the risk of radicalization um, at the time of data collection. Uh, and so this youth security in the camp uh, isn't, uh, there hasn't been to my knowledge, and I know some of you on this call may have experience in Dada. Um, and may want to contribute uh, what your experience is. But there hasn't been, to my knowledge, anything directly related to smartphones and cameras. Um, but keeping in mind that people will be able to, um, I just saw another message popped up related to this topic, so I'm just gonna answer it right now. Uh, we, did, we did oral consent in the, getting um, the privacy issues. Uh, and that's mostly because of writing um, and literacy. So youth security in the camp related to uh, having access to smartphones and cameras is not something that I've heard about um, specifically, but I would say that youth security in the camp is something that we discussed at length during the interviews, um, especially related to social change projects for peace building, for social cohesion, and what that really meant for the youth who are participating in them, the risks that they may be facing, and what further training that they wanted related to that topic. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. We are still good on time, so I think we'll just go back and um, and wrap up some additional questions for Alban. Um, and there's two here that I see. Uh, one, uh, what are the main challenges, what have been the main challenges to get the M&E process done? Um, and I think the dashboard one we've already answered is the dashboard interactive. And then the third, what's an example of a data-driven decision that was taken as a result of having this real-time or readily accessible data? Great, thank you for, for those two questions, um, really interesting ones. Um, so in terms of, of the challenges, um, I, I think that there were um, different type of challenges. Um, so one being around the technology um, and making sure that we find a platform uh, and the solution that can be used in, in the local context and is robust enough um, to accommodate any changes in the local context. Um, so that, that was um, something that um, can be viewed as a challenge and it can take time to, to make sure that you're making the right decision when, when selecting your, your technology partner. Um, I think overall with m and &E, um, there were we were really keen to collect as much information as possible um, about the impact of the program, et cetera. Uh, and I think the um, actually restricting yourself uh, and defining what is the key information um, that you really need to start with 
acknowledging that over time you will be able to uh, increase um, the level of data um, that you collect uh, and add new uh, data points for, for the team to, to collect uh, in the ground was, was a key challenge um, for us. So really identify what is the key critical information that I need now and then over time we can build on, on what's existing. Um, and I think that's a process that um, any m and &E project um, have. Uh, I mean, it's a challenge for, for, for m and &E processes, but particularly when it comes to technology and you're introducing something new to the team, um, it's important to, to make sure that you build confidence before actually increasing the scope. Um, uh, and then I think a really important um, that I mentioned earlier is really involving the team in the design process to ensure buy-in. Um, so that can be logistically challenging when you're operating across four countries and you need to make sure um, all your KPIs are aligned to, to the local uh, school system, et cetera. But this is a, a process um, that is really worth doing after for, for the long-term quality of the data you, you collect. Um, yes, so I hope that, that answered this, uh, this question. Um, and in terms of example of uh, data-driven decision um, resulting from, from the dashboard that we have, um, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and I think one, probably one of the best examples that I could give um, is that um, we actually saw in Kakuma um, and Niagusu uh, a drop in, in the level of activities in the INS centers. Um, so there were a bit less lessons happening. Um, and so we started to engage with the local team to understand uh, why um, this was happening. Uh, and really what it came down to was actually the lake uh, of time uh, for the teachers to be able to prepare their lessons ahead, um, ahead of delivering it uh, to the students. So this preparation time was not something that we initially uh, factored in, in in the INS operation uh, and effectively following this discussion we had with the team, we were able to modify the INS timetable, um, because there is a timetable to use um, the classroom to accommodate um, the whole of Friday free for teachers to come in and um, only dedicate their time to preparing their lesson for the following week. Uh, and this decision, um, after a couple of weeks, we actually saw again um, an increase in the level of activities during the four other day of the week um, in the, the INS centers. Um, so that's one decision, uh, but then there, there are many more. Um, some of them are more technology oriented, for example. So uh, a lot of teachers um, were, were um, reporting to us that um, it was actually really difficult um, to store and, and create their own content and store it um, um, to be able to uh, deliver a lesson. And we recently uh, delivered a new platform which enabled uh, the teachers to create their lesson and store it on the local on a local server um, so that they can keep it for next year, improve it, but also share it with other teachers and therefore enable more collaborative work uh, in, in the school. But all of those challenges were actually identified by um, the beneficiaries of the program and shared with us through the platform by the INS team. Uh, and thanks to this data, we, we are always able to improve um, the, the program and, and how it operates in the field. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both of our presenters. That's all the time we have uh, today. But thanks to Alban and to Ali for sharing their work with us. Um, this is a really interesting uh, topic and great question. So thanks also to all of the participants and those of you who had um, questions and comments for us. Just as a reminder, you can still see the, get, you can access the presentations um, and there will be contact information for both the presenters um, on the INEE site as well as a recording of this webinar. 
Um, so thanks very much, and we hope to see you at uh, the next webinar in this series. Stay tuned. <laughs>